today is uh, today is a lecture that's going to uh, present uh, quantum computation in some in some form of a unified perspective. I, I keep alluding to the fact that every quantum computation is really a more generalized kind of integral and, uh, and and today I want to show you that that somehow it all really reduces down to uh, to phase estimation in the sense that what really discriminates quantum from classical computation is that you can not only do things in, in one particular basis, uh, but you can also go into the rotated basis, and that's actually the same as uh, tuning the phase between different orthogonal states. So in some sense, if you can control that, that phase initially, and if, if you can estimate what you did, uh, finally you actually have a quantum computer in general. So it really is a... It's, 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 a, it's a statement of, of, of high generality that anything you do ends up being some kind of phase estimation. I'll try to talk about it today. So, um, so I guess among, among these things, um, uh, we, we start with a single qubit uh, phase. And a special case of this, we already said, was Deutsch's algorithm. So, so estimating uh, phase is really... Um, in this case, the phase is very simple. It's really just zero pi. But if you want a more general phase, then I think you you, you can phrase it in this way as well. The second uh, the second example will be to extend this a little bit and to talk about estimating um, uh, density matrices. Now, this is an interesting uh, statement because density matrices, you would think. Um, uh, I need to estimate density matrices by estimating the, the spectrum of these guys, eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Um, so why is that a phase estimation? Um, but you will see that I will phrase it exactly within the same interferometric setting that, uh, that actually you really can measure. Uh, I already said density matrix is a Hermitian operator, so of course you should be able to estimate it. But there's a very beautiful way using interferometers to show you how this is done. Um, what I will then go on to say is that you can do, you can do more interesting things, um, which is estimating uh, the effect. So now you can estimate entanglement as well. Not just a single density matrix, but if you have two qubit density matrix, um, you can do estimating the effect, if you to put it properly, uh, of partial uh, trans transposition. Uh, this also may come as a little bit of a surprise in the sense that, um, in the sense that uh, I already, I, I, we, by now we know that a partial transposition is a, is a positive map, not completely positive. It's something that leads to a negative. Um, a negative um, uh, probability distribution. So obviously, I cannot, I cannot implement the partial transposition directly on a density matrix, and then say, oh, now I'm going to go back to algorithm two and I'm going to estimate the density matrix, and that's it. Then I got some, I get some negative eigenvalue. That's great. But you can't do that because uh, it's not a physical operation. So clearly, I have to be doing something more intelligent than that. So I will show you that partial transposition can actually be implemented, but not as a naked partial transposition on the state itself, but within a trace. And then it really becomes the same as a witness of entanglement. And that's just a Hermitian operator. And negative numbers are OK if you have Hermitian operators. It's a very intelligent way. It took a long time to, for people to figure out that you could do that. People played all sorts of tricks to avoid this negativity. I'll tell you about it as we go along as well. I'll talk, tell you about the evolution of these ideas. And then at some stages it became obvious that you can do it directly, which is very interesting. Um, what you can get from this guy is also new algorithms. And I think I will call it as power of a single, single qubit. Um, so the interesting uh, conclusion here will be this is a very important discussion that, uh, that's taking place. Actually, it's been, it's been around for the last 10 years, probably, uh, which is how, how powerful can a quantum computer be if I, may, if I decohere it very strongly, if I leave only... In this case, it's an extreme case where only a single qubit is pure. And in fact, I will even make that... Let's put it this way. Only a single qubit is not completely mixed. And I don't care. I make it just a little bit 
away from identity. The rest of the qubits in the computer are completely mixed, depolarized. And I'll show you that there are algorithms where a quantum computer is exponentially more efficient than classical. That's interesting. And I start asking the question, so does that mean that there is no entanglement there and I still have a speed up? And the answer is yes, probably that's the case. We have no entanglement and there is a speed up. So that's an interesting statement for us in the sense of can we do this always? Is this just a, an isolated set of problems or is this actually as powerful as any other as any other quantum computation? And I think that's very interesting. And then, of course, what we are going to be uh, ultimately looking at is, um, is Shor's algorithm, I suppose, and within, within the framework of phase estimation. So that's going to be the final, the final thing we'll do as far as algorithm, algorithms are concerned. Um, and then I think we'll have uh, something like two days left to, to talk uh, about errors, how to model errors in general, where do they come from, what's the origin of these things, because we've already covered a few of the physical implementations, and then we'll talk about how to universally tackle this problem and error correct no matter what. You just, I don't care what the implementation is, I can show you that I can error correct. Uh, providing that I have a sufficient reliability of an individual gate that I can do that. So if I can do my control knot with whatever 99.999 efficiency, then I can show that I can amplify anything that happens to any qubit um, uh, to a unity, no matter what happens to that and how noisy things are. So, so we have some general results of, of this type. Now, uh, let's, let's start with this single qubit phase. So, in Deutsch's al algorithm, you're really talking about discriminating two different states, which ended up ultimately being 0 plus 1 and 0 minus 1. And we know that this is very easy to do because they're orthogonal states. So someone gives you, you know, 0 and 1 in, in, in the interferometer were the two different parts, and this just means they have exactly the same phase. Uh, and this means they have opposite phase. And these are the two cases, A and B, in Deutsch's algorithm that you have to estimate. Of course, you can say, what if I give you a more general phase? How do I achieve this kind of, what's the, what's the algorithm for, for that? Um, like that. Um, and, and, and now you have to be a little bit more creative, because it's not entirely clear what's the, what's the most optimal way of estimating this phase. Of course, if I give you a general phase and I give you one qubit, you're never going to be able to do it. So clearly you need more qubits, and now you enter the game of, oh, now I can couple maybe the qubits and do something more non-trivial and so on. So the game becomes a bit more complicated. Um, everything in quantum physics is encoded as a phase. This is a very general thing here. This is how you measure any field in nature as well. So basically, if you want to measure the uh, electromagnetic field, you take your charge and you make some closed loop. Ideally, you would make a closed loop on, um, uh, around a very small, infinitesimally small area. And the phase that you would get from, from that um, would be the usual e to the i times the magnetic field times the area, the flux. Okay, the Aharon bomb kind of effect. And if I take the electron and circle it around all points in space time, and I give you all my results, that's equivalent to me giving you Maxwell's equations. It's just another alternative description of, any, of, of the electromagnetic field. This one happens to be more natural given quantum mechanics because this is how I will be doing. So any field you kick into the phase actually and then you estimate the phase. You can measure the gravitational field like that with an interferometer where this guy is in a higher field than this guy and so on. So this, this is it. So I'm trying to say this is not a special example. This is what, the way we do things in, in quantum mechanics. But now we look at these phases encoding some problem rather than encoding the any kind of physical field. And, and so how would you do this? Well, first of all, if you think of the interferometer again, uh, the nice thing is that um, this phase, again, we have some element that introduces the phase, if you like. Probably I should put it in the other arm because I think the picture is going to become a little bit more complicated as I start adding, adding bits into it. Um, so basically, some of these, one of these arms gets a phase, and let's call it phase five. 
Um, and, and then I recombine these guys, and all of you know that, uh, that now these outputs are going to depend on, on the phase, on the phase phi. Uh, so basically what enters, uh, if, if you think of this guy, again, I, you know, last time I labeled this appropriately with different numbers, but if you think of this guy, for example, as zero and this guy as one, uh, what I'm really saying is that the element zero has a phase phi and the element one has no extra phase when they meet in the last beam splitter. And now the last beam splitter gets basically a, just applies a Hadamard to these guys. So if you like, this guy goes into zero uh, plus one times e to the i phi and this is uh, zero minus one. And here I only measure in the zero one basis, okay? <coughs> so I just get a click. If the photon goes here, it's one. If it goes here, it's zero. And and now I put I put together zeros and ones. So you can see that this guy uh, will be the zero element, and then e to the i phi minus one will be the one element, okay? The first guy is actually the, uh, a cause. If I normalize everything properly, uh, and if I pull out uh, an overall phase, this guy is just a cause of phi divided by two. Okay. If I take out e to the i phi by two, then I'm left with e to the i phi by two plus e to the minus i phi by two, and that's actually cause. If I do the same here, of course, I'm left with sign. Probably there is an imaginary there that no one cares about because I'm going to be measuring these guys anyway in the zero one basis. And, and now I've got the probabilities to get zero and to get one at the output. And that's that's the key issue of the interferometer. So I've converted a phase. This is now a phase between zero and one. I've converted the phase into the amplitude of these states, and that's the key. And now I measure the states. And with probability cos squared phi over two, I will get zero. And with probability sine squared phi over two, I get one. Okay, so everyone knows this. And, and, and that's it, that's your, that's, your, that's your phase estimation. Now, um, is this the most intelligent thing we can do? Uh, the answer is no do better than that. You've seen Shor's algorithm, what we should really be doing. I don't want to say too much about it because I'll be talking about it as we go along. I want to go in, in the direction of estimating density matrices. But it's clear that you can't do that from a single shot, obviously, because it's either going to end up here or here, uh, and you can't uh, build up probabilities for that. But if someone keeps sending you a photon through this, and you do this n times, then you'll build up enough of, of confidence, basically, to tell what the P0 and P1 are to a certain degree of accuracy. And this, is, this is a basic phase estimation. Uh, the, only, the only thing that I said is if someone really gives you n photons, it's very short-sighted to send them in one by one, given that you can actually do all sorts of funny things with them and interact them first of all and so on. So maybe there's a better way of doing it. Rather than doing exactly the same interferometer on each of them and measuring, why not do some kind of intelligent computation on them and then measure them? And yes, you guessed it. What you really should be doing is a Fourier transform here. Rotate them into the complementary basis, then measure in that basis. And that's actually the most efficient phase estimation you can, you can have. The efficiency is measured uh, according to how quickly do I approach the exact values given the number of measurements I have to make. How does it scale with the number of qubits, if you like? Anything, I'll say a bit more about it later. It links to all sorts of issues like the phase of a, of a quantum state and how do we define phase and how do we think of these things and is there a phase operator and so on. This was a, a big issue in quantum optics for a long time. It's no longer an issue at all. Um, okay, so, so what can I do now? I have this guy. Can I generalize it a little bit more? And here's an interesting observation. Imagine I have an extra degree of freedom. This is not an extra photon. This is the same. I just have to draw it like that because I don't know how else to draw it. This is an extra degree of freedom of the photon itself. So here I've got a photon. Here
here, let's imagine I've got the polarization of this photon, okay? And it could be in any state you like, the polarization of the photon. I prepare it in some 45 degrees or whatever else. I could be mixed in there. And the mixed one is going to be the interesting one to us. And what I'm going to do now is basically ask myself what happens um, what happens if I do a controlled unitary transformation some u we'll be choosing interesting u's later on that, that are relevant to us but let's say for now I do any unitary transformation on this row this notation here, you see I'm kind of mixing the interferometer with the genuine quantum computational notations it gets, it gets a bit confusing but what I have in mind is that only if the photon is here do I apply the transformation U if the photon is in the other branch I'm going to stick to this phase you can set the phase equal to zero if you like and it's going to be the same, the same logic and now the question is how does this transformation here modify the outputs and first of all, does it modify the outputs? And, and the usual answer is that the, the interference is changed once there is a, a way of differentiating between what happens to one part and what happens to the other part. Okay? So for example, if there was no phi there, and if there was no this guy, then there would be exactly the same part and the photon would always come out this way. If I do something to one part, like this unitary transformation, then I'm kind of tagging, I'm labeling it in a different way. I'm telling the environment, this guy is the environment now. I'm telling the environment I'm doing something here, but I'm not doing anything over there, which should intuitively tell you that something should change as far as these probabilities are concerned. And the question is, what is it that changes? Let me just sketch, sketch to you briefly how this is calculated so that you just it's a very simple calculation, it's a three-line calculation. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, I'm going to basically write the algorithm like this. I start with a photon in the state zero. State zero means it's coming from this direction. That's this zero here. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to label the internal degree of freedom with another, it's another subsystem like even though it belongs to the same photon in this case and now I'm going to follow the network then so I do exactly the calculation I did the only thing is that I've got this extra transformation to implement here so basically there's a beam splitter which does a Hadamard and the Hadamard is applied only to this guy which means what I've got is something like 0 plus 1 I'm going to spell it out just for you to see how this goes 0 plus 1 tensor product row so I've rotated this into H, H. And that's the first beam splitter. OK, there are some eyes there upon reflection, but we don't really care about it. I'm going to call them other gates. And, and, and now we do the controlled unitary. But what does it mean controlled? Well, it means controlled on the fact that if the photon is here, if the photon is over there, I'm just going to kick in the phase as usual. So what this means is I have to first expand this into four possible states. And now I have to I have to condition it on zero. I should have probably labeled them the other way around so that I do something when I have one. It would have been like a control node. But here I'm doing something if I have zero, and I'm not doing anything if I have one. Um, so zero means this zero means I'm going to apply u to rho. This zero means I'm going to apply u from the other side, which is actually u dagger. OK, the resulting state is going to be like that. Here. Okay. Then I've got u applied only on one side and nothing on the other side, because I'm saying when, you have, when the photon is in the upper branch, I'm not going to do anything to that. So I switch zeros and ones just, just to confuse you. Test how good you are at adjusting to it. It's an accident. So basically, 0, 1 now gives me u acting on rho. Okay? And then nothing, no u dagger because I've got 1 here, and so on. Okay? Um, and what you do ultimately, again, is you can kick in the phase phi now if you have a state 1, 
It's, it's the same as, as this. And then ultimately, you really have another beam splitter, which means you just rotate whatever you had here. You apply the transformation that 0 goes into 0 plus 1, and 1 goes into 0 minus 1. Okay? And you do it on both sides. And then you group the terms. And you group the terms because you want to know the probability for those guys coming out in the zero direction and for those guys coming out. I'm actually so confused now that I don't know which one is zero or one. But one is zero and one is one. I mean, who cares? Okay, I've, I've mixed them. Um, it's enough just to have two of them. Anyhow, so what, what you're asking now is how does this guy change uh, depending on the unitary transformation u and, and the state Row. Um, and it turns out that it's um, that it's it's actually nice to look at it. Uh, so you can think of this really as some kind of interference interference bridges. If you plot like p zero, sometimes people plot the difference between the p zero and p one. There will be some kind of visibility looking at the difference between a minimum and a maximum. You can compute whatever you like. They're all very similar expressions. So if you think of it as a, as, a, as a P0, and you think of it as, as some kind of a function of phi, here is phi, and you ask, just plot the cos squared, and you ask yourself, uh, and you ask yourself, well, okay, now what, uh, what, happens, what happens if I have this extra bit there from this calculation? What you will see is that there are two effects on this intensity, okay? One effect is to reduce the visibility of the fringes. And the other effect is to shift the fringes, like a phase shift. It's the same as, as what this guy does, shifts by some phase phi. So let me write it down, the key quantity. The key quantity is trace. That's what comes out when you, when you project ultimately onto 0 and 1 and you get all of these guys. The, the, the ultimate quantity is the trace of the unitary transformation times the density matrix itself. <coughs> the, there is no u dagger. This is the quantity that matters here. It doesn't have the form u rho u dagger. Okay? And this is very important statement. Uh, it doesn't look physical inside the trace, but I'm actually taking the trace of the guy and the trace of the guy is a complex number in general. So this number is going to have a real part, the modulus, and it's going to have phase. The real part will tell you about how much the visibility has gone down of the fringes. The phase is going to tell you by how much you shift it. So basically this whole thing will look something like that. Okay? This guy is your theta, and this reduction here is your r. Okay. If this gate is very strongly entangling, then you will make this a completely mixed state, and you will kill any phase information. Your r is going to be zero. It's going to be a flat thing. Okay. On the other hand, if you don't entangle too much, you'll be able to maintain somehow the visibility you may be able to measure the phase shift that you get as a result of that. So R and theta, R, they're the numbers, the two numbers that you can experimentally access. This is not very important. You can measure. Just from that interferometer. It's very easy to measure. That. Again, by repeating it a number of times. Um, so for example, if someone comes to you and says, I want you to do the following operation. Here is your density matrix, and I want you to get this. And you look at them and you say, wait a second, have you done quantum mechanics undergraduate course number one? It cannot look like that. It's not a unitary transformation. It needs to look, it's not a CP map. It needs to look like that. And the guy says, no, I want you to do that. I want you to measure the effect of that. That's OK. Provided that what he really means is that you are measuring this guy. No problem under the trace. Okay, this really converts into a physical expression of that type. And now you can see why I will be able to do tomography, meaning I will be able to estimate the effects of impossible operations. Because even though they are impossible, they're going to be hiding under the trace symbol. 
and I'm going to be using this interferometer. Okay, so this, the, the summary of what I'm going to really do is this tomography of impossible physical operations. And one of them is, is, is partial transposition. It's a very beautiful <coughs> one. So no problem there. Now, let's see how, how do I do estimating density matrices once I, once I know, once I know this logic. Uh, this, this idea was due to Gardner. Uh, here is how it goes. He says, uh, okay, um, what if I have two copies of the same state? They, all, you, know, you can actually teach quantum physics by just teaching this lecture, and it contains more information than all your undergraduate courses or mine that I have put together. Now, um, what he says is, why don't I add, let me add it on this picture, why don't I add another density matrix here in a state row? It's a little bit more difficult to think of it now as a photon because you can say which are, I, I don't have two polarization, two different independent degrees of freedom. Let's now decouple ourselves from photons and just think of something that has uh, two qubits internally. Okay, spin three half or whatever. Right? It's it's a it's a, it's now a massive particle. Never mind. Um, and and this goes through the interferometer. And the gate I'm going to implement is swap gate. So now it's going to get really interesting. And I'm going to claim now that this measures the trace of the square of the density matrix. So, why? Because the quantity that you measure is simply trace of the unitary transformation and row. But in this case, this happens to be trace of the swap operation. And my input state is now not just single row, but a combination of rows. Okay? This is a swap of one and two. This is number one and number two, but they're prepared in the same state. It's exactly the same density matrix. So I can measure that, because I can measure the real part of this guy, and I can measure the, the, the imaginary part. So basically, if you like, from here, the real part is just a modulus of the trace of the row, and the theta is just the argument of the trace of the row. Um, so why is this good? Because, so what am I going to do here? I mean, here is the spooky bit of this thing. I and mean, then I will explain it a little bit better. I claimed before that these probabilities will be effective only if there is a trace of my action here based on the photon going here. If this action is inconsequential to the environment, then I cannot modify the superpositions. Superpositions are modified, modified by doing something to one element and not doing it to the other element. What am I doing here? I'm swapping these two states. But hey, it's the same state. Am I just not going to get row, row to go into the same state? It's the swap state. They're the same state. How can I ever detect the swap in this guy? Because I made a mistake somewhere. And and what I wrote down there is not true. A swap doesn't do anything only if you start with a symmetric state. But a product of two identical density matrices is not, doesn't, does not lie in the symmetric subspace. State psi psi does for a pure state, but not state row row. That's not what you get at the output. Okay. I'll give you a little bit of a better intuition in a second. I just want to complete the the calculation to show you what, what happens there. What happens here now is that you'll be swapping the states of these two rows. And, and for example, what you'll be doing is you will expand. To see what happens is you expand row as some kind of um, eigen expansion of um, eigenvectors ri and eigenvalues r. Uh, and then I'm going to do the same for row 2. Okay, so let's use some index J now, RJ, RJ, RJ. And the swap only acts on one side. That's the impossible part of it, okay, in some sense. But I'm not doing that physically. I'm doing the proper swap on both sides. But the effect of that on the interference fringes looks like something that should not be allowed physically. But it is, okay? So it's, it's always the same message that I'm conveying. If I swap Ri and Rj here, only not these guys, not on the other side, just on one side, 
then you will see that when I take the trace of these guys, the off-diagonal elements will kill each other. And what I'm going to really get is sum over Ri squared. There won't be any Ri Rj because I moved the Ri here. And the inner product of Ri Rj is just a delta function. It's only one when, when i is equal to j. I've killed all the off-diagonal elements by swapping one side. And the sum of the squares of the, of the eigenvalues is simply the row, trace of row squared. Okay, this is trace of row squared. Now, how do I get trace of row cubed? I insert three density matrices there. So this is not something I'd like you to do in your lab tomorrow because it's very difficult, of course. But in principle, it's the same interferometer. I extend it. And I perform a generalized swap. What does this guy do? He does something that commutes things in a non-trivial way. So basically, this kind of an action now would be something like psi 1, psi 2, psi 3, gone into psi 2, psi 3, psi 1. And that's enough to commute them enough uh, to the extent that you kill all the off diagonal elements. And if you have this kind of swap, let's call it S1, 2, 3, then the trace of S123 and rho tensor rho tensor rho is simply trace of rho cubed. And so on ad infinitum. Any power. So you give me n copies of the density matrix. And here is the tomography that I'm doing. I estimate the square of the density matrix, which is the cube and so on. How much do I need to go up to have all the eigenvalues? Only up to the rank of the matrix. And then I have n equations with n unknowns, independent equation I can invert them to get all the unknowns. Okay. So basically what this guy gives, so first of all I know that the sum R1 plus R2 plus whatever is the size of the matrix is 1. It's normalized. Now I'm experimentally obtaining R1 squared, R2 squared, Rn squared, given. I'm obtaining the cube, the fourth, whatever is the dimensionality, the n r to the n, all experimentally obtainable now. r1 to the n plus r2 to the n, blah, 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 given. n independent equations with n unknowns. Unique solution for the density matrix that I want. Okay. Here's the spectrum of the density matrix for you. That's how you would do it in a simple quantum computer. OK, so that's nice, nice and simple. And now what I really want to do, and I don't have too much time, is the following. So I want to first explain why there is nothing funny about exchanging these guys. And then I want to, and then I want to probably stop a little bit and then continue with the, with the entitlement destination in the next lecture. Um, think of it from the, from the higher Hilbert space picture. That's always the nicest one. Think of this density matrix as being half of the system which is entangled to another half. Think of it in the proper way, as I call it, or philosophers call it improper. So think of this swap gate. Here is the swap. And you have these two qubits. But actually, they are mixed, means that they come from entanglements with something else, some kind of environment. I don't care what it is. So the interferometer is up there. Here is just a picture of this guy here. Now I swap the guys. So look, one is entangled to three, two is entangled to four. Now I exchange them. Is there something different in the universe? You bet there is. Now one is entangled to four, and two is entangled to three. So even though the swap operation looks like it's not doing anything, on the state row, row, if you think of it at a higher level, it creates out of an entanglement like that, an entangled state like that. And surely this is different physically. Surely this is something the universe, God, ourselves, everyone else notices. Bang. That's why you were in fact in your universe. This is just another way of teaching you that this state does not lie in the symmetric substance. It's not a symmetric state. 
very much like that. So what I'm going to do is uh, make a 10 minute break, come back to exactly the same picture, and show you how to implement partial transposition now, estimate the effect of the partial transposition and get a negative value about it. And then I'll show you how to implement these algorithms that are exponentially more efficient by just one single cube. The single cubic is going to be this guy here. And these guys are going to be maximally mixed. I'm not even going to make it any state row. I'm going to make it maximally deep order. So I'm going to kill everything quantum mechanic on there. And I'll still show you that you can be exponentially better. That's really interesting, actually. It's even more interesting to see whether this is a useful set of algorithms. Let's make it 10 minutes better. Okay, so uh, the last uh, the last part today will really be about uh, concluding the discussion we started, and I really hope that the weather will help us and uh, thunder will basically come up uh, exactly when I get the most romantic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, it will be very Shakespearean. Uh, okay, so now what I want to do is I want to say this: even though I cannot, I cannot. Um, go from the state row into the partially transposed state row. Uh, let's call this uh, 1, 2, and then row 1, 2, transpose 2. So that's not allowed according to quantum mechanics. There is nothing preventing me from calculating traces of these guys. Because traces, I mean, they could be anything. Yeah. Traces are averages of permission operators. That's the physical trace of something. is. It's like measuring the expectation value, and this is always what you do, and it could be a negative number. There's no problem with that. So this is not possible, but, now, but actually we already know that this is equal to 1 anyway. Because if one of the numbers is minus a half, the other three numbers happen to be a half or a cubic, and they all sum up to 1 anyway. We can also measure, and that's what I want to show you, that's the key thing. We can also measure trace row 1, 2, t2 squared. And we can measure q power and so on. And in the same way that I was estimating the spectrum, you look at this in this belief. I, I tell you it's possible. Okay, I'll show you in a second how it is. So basically, um, you can compute any power and you need to go up to the rank, like I said, of the, of the matrix more or less. And, and then from inverting this equation, set of equations back, you can calculate the spectrum. And if you get a negative eigenvalue, then you're done. The initial state was an entangled state. It's as simple as that. How do I do that? What I need to do is I need to in input two copies, each of which is an entangled state itself. So this line now is two qubits, and this line is two qubits. Okay. So the formula the trace of a swap 1, 3, 2, 4, row 1, 2, row 3, 4. So if I have an entangled state row 1, 2, and I have a copy, I'm just labeling it 3, 4 for you to see the indices of the swap. But row 1, 2 is the same as row 3, 4. It's the same state. I'm going to have n copies of this time. And if I now swap first qubit from the first entangled state with the first qubit from the second and the second, what you can now calculate, and I really encourage you to do that, is that this is really the trace of row 1, 2 partially transposed squared, providing that these guys are the same density matrix. And now if I do, if I do swaps with three entangled states, and I do the first, second, and third, you know, and so on. Um, then I will do a more generalized swap, and I can get. So basically, what I'm saying is, if I do S one three five, S two four six in a state one two three four five six. Again, each of these is the same density matrix. I'm just labeling them to get the the right um, transformation here. This is going to be trace of row 1, 2, partially transposed, cubed, and so on. So it's the same single qubit interferometer. By single qubit, I mean this guy is a single qubit. Two possibilities. And it's coupled to something more complicated, like, like 
you know, free and bundled states or whatever else. But if you do the, your transformations right, you can compute higher powers of these guys. And now you can invert them and you can see what the eigenvalues are. So this is not a direct implementation of partial transposition because I can't do it directly. But if I have a trace in front of it, then there is no problem. And that's the main message of this kind of stuff. OK, what about, and so you can measure these things. This, was, this had a very interesting history because people were thinking, how do I actually make a partial transposition when it gives me something that's not physical? And the first idea, which was also a beautiful idea, but it wasn't as nice as this guy. This guy is direct. The first idea was to say, let's take my state, rho 1, 2, and add a little bit of a maximally mixed state. So make this like, uh, you know, lambda or whatever. 1 minus lambda, this guy plus lambda identity. Okay? If I put a partial transport, transpose on top of this, this will have a negative eigenvalue. But if I only do that with a fraction, then the positive eigenvalue from this guy is going to shift the whole spectrum. So adding a unity shifts the whole spectrum by one quarter up. And if my negative eigenvalue is something like a quarter minus a quarter, I can cancel that out by adding the identity. So even though I cannot do a partial transposition on the guy itself, I can certainly do a partial transposition on this and nothing negative will come out. Or I can do something that looks like partial transposition. And I think that was the first idea. And, and, and then we actually realized, people realized that you can just do, do this directly without shifting the spectrum or anything funny like that. Um, and of course, we know that we can do this physically because, like I said, doing this is nothing but computing the trace of your witness times the density matrix. So we know that we can witness and bundle them. And that's how we do it. This is almost a direct conversion of a partial transposition into an emission operator. And then you measure it as the clicks and the output of the integral. OK, now, the, the next thing I wanted to do is this power of a single And this, I think, was, was realized in something like 1989. That this is really backwards engineering in, in, in some sense. Uh, in a way that once you know you can do this, you're going to ask yourself, what is the problem that this guy solves by itself? It looks very, it looks very nice. It looks like a single qubit and then coupled to a register. And then, like I said, what if I ask my register? So let's go back to the to the to the picture where this is a general unitary transformation. And, you are, and then I have some number of qubits that are coming here. I mean, it doesn't matter what they are, but let's say they are really all maximally mixed states of qubits. No, no coherence here. No, so, uh, really, I toss a coin and I prepare these guys randomly. And you see, you see how interesting it is because you would say, what are you doing? You get it's the same thing that that in a way looks counterintuitive. It looks like it would be completely crazy to put identity there. Because identity stays identity when you act on, on it by a unitary transformation. This is still identity. So how am I going to get anything useful out of that? What's the point of me doing that? And the point is that, remember, what you are measuring is always the trace of your unitary transformation times this row. But the row is a bunch of identities. So what this becomes is trace of the unitary transformation itself. Some of the diagonal elements of a unitary transformation. And now you choose your favorite unitary transformation. You should choose a random unitary transformation. Write it down on a piece of paper. Give it to a classical computer to, to estimate in some sense. So imagine I have n qubits. This is 2 to the n by 2 to the n matrix. Okay? So n qubits. This u in general is a matrix like that. 2 to the n times 2 to the n matrix. So I'm choosing a random one. I'm choosing a random one just to show you that every unitary is actually as difficult as every other. 
I mean, if I choose a simple one with only two entries, it's going to be easy. But in general, a random transformation is going to be more difficult. Trace means I sum up all the diagonal elements. If I use a classical computer, I'm going to have to do it 2 to the n times. I'm going to have to sum up the first plus second plus third plus 2 to the n. Okay? So classically, <coughs> Uh, trace of u requires um, 2 to the n additions. So in a way, this is what we call exponentially inefficient because I've got n qubits, but the time, even though I'm only doing additions, I've got to do so many additions that actually there is an exponential number of them and that's not so easy. I've got there an interferometer that does it in a single shot. Of course, it's not quite a single shot because I have to build up the right spectrum here to estimate the trace. I can't do the trace in one go because if the photon comes here, I have no idea what the trace is. But, but basically, if I repeat this n times, so now quantumly, uh, trace u requires n, n interferometers or n repetitions of the same interferometer. And it's going to get you the phase to exactly the same degree of accuracy, more or less, as the classical one. So it's something that really scales polynomially as the number of qubits with this guy really scales exponentially. You see, it's a very artificial problem. I'm really, I'm saying I know how to compute trace of u. Let me think of a problem that, that, uh, that this is suitable for. Why not trace of u itself, you know, is the problem. This goes back to Feynman's idea of, of the fact that Quantum systems are better at simulating themselves than classical ones, by definition. I mean, they're just doing whatever they do. And this is exactly that kind of interferometer. So now, what's so interesting about this? Well, what's so interesting is that I'm having an exponential gap from only a single pure qubit. All of this is now completely mixed. And of course, the first question is, can I make it even more, more dramatic? And you can. So basically, why have the first qubit as a pure qubit? Why not mix it? Um, what would it mean to mix it within this interferometer? It would mean that sometimes I inject the photon from here, sometimes I inject it from here. I don't know which way I inject it. If I do it completely randomly, then of course I cannot do anything. The whole thing is maximally mixed. But if I do it a little bit more from zero direction than from one, it's already sufficient to get an exponential increase. Why? Well, because if you think of this qubit as, as p0 plus 1 minus p1, I can always write this as a pure state plus a maximally mixed state. So basically, a nice way of looking at this guy is to say with some, with some probability epsilon, I've got 0. And with 1 minus epsilon, I've got an equal mixture of 0. So you see, if I take a little bit of P to match it with this, put it over there, I'm going to be getting some, some formula like, like that, OK? So I'm thinking of this as this guy is completely useless for me, as far as computation is concerned. This guy has an epsilon chance of getting things right, OK? Now, fix your epsilon. Okay, 10 to minus 27, great, here is your epsilon. As long as it's independent of n, I don't want it to scale with n down, because then of course I'm going to screw things up. But give me a fixed epsilon, no matter how small, I'm always going to get an exponential gap. There will, there will always be a sufficiently large, and so my quantum efficiency now is something like 1 over epsilon times n. Because I've got to repeat it 1 over epsilon times, to amplify a probability epsilon to unity. I want to amplify this guy to unity. That's what it means that I did something proper in a quantum computer. Which means roughly I have to repeat it one over epsilon times. But if epsilon is constant, I don't care. Because it's still a, a, a linear function of n. This is not dependent on, on n. And so there is still an exponential gap between a classical and a quantum algorithm, no matter how mixed this pure state is. That's a stunning result. Now I'm really destroying everything. I'm going to get it so close to identity that there won't be any entanglement anywhere. 
now you tell me what's responsible for the speed up in this kind of compute. I have no idea. And it's really an interesting, an interesting question. So I'm going to make this guy so mixed that if you look at this division, you will never get entanglement across this divide. You can show that it's a separable state. And if you mix it even more, you can even see that there are no entanglements within this guy because these are already maximum mixed states. And still, I'm achieving an exponential gap. So that's interesting. So can you do this with Rover? Can you, you know, do it with Shore and so on? We have no idea. But I think that's one of the, the nicest open questions that we have. Um, notice that if I ask the scaling to go as a function of n, so for example, if you say, what if I want this probability to go down uh, as 1 over 2 to the n? This happens in NMR, and that's the problem in, with NMR. In NMR, your mixedness increases with the number of atoms you're trying to control at the same time within a molecule, and it goes down like that, which is why we think we cannot handle 20 uh, nuclei, because it's already 2 to the minus 20 weak. If you have something like that, then of course, your 1 over epsilon becomes 2 to the n times n, and you've killed any quantum mechanical advantage. Okay, So the key thing is to fix this epsilon. And that's actually, this kind of scaling is what gives us all the problems when we're trying to prove that you do ultimately require entanglement. We just don't know how to handle these mixed states that are not entangled very, very well. OK, now, the final thing. That, uh, that I really wanted to start. Probably I won't be able to, to finish it today completely. Uh, is really the following. Um, I think I should probably just start the discussion which I mentioned uh, before. So what is, what is a general way, uh, general phase estimation? So Shaw's algorithm will, will actually turn out to be a general phase estimation. So we don't, we don't really, once you understand this, I think it's going to be very easy to describe the, the algorithm itself. But I want to talk a little bit about the phase uh, because it's an interesting concept in itself. Um, so the first time that people thought about phase in quantum mechanics, is to really try to think of it as an operator. Because everything that we think we can measure, we also think we can represent as an emission operator. And the first idea, I think, and this was probably 20 years ago, even more maybe, uh, was to try to say, well, why not come up with an emission operator uh, that I call a phase operator, in a way that this guy and the average value of this guy is going to define the phase of my quantum state. It's a very natural assumption. If, you, if I claim that there is a phase to the quantum state and I want to estimate it, then why not try to represent it as an operator and, and then just measure the operator on whatever state. You give me the state uh, and you, you want to know the, the phase of this guy, all I do is just that. I repeat, I repeat the measurement of this guy n number of times and on average, I'm going to get the phase as a real number. This is your phase uh, that comes out. So does this make any sense? Um, OK, the idea was, was as follows. Uh, you can think of it already in a, in, a, in a single qubit case. So phase is something that's conjugate, complementary to number. Um, if, I know, if I know a number of a state very well, if I know if it's state 0, or 1, or 2, then basically I have no information about the phase because whichever phase you kick in in front of this guy, it's going to give you the same unit probability outcome at the end. So it's clear that I have to go into some kind of superposition of, of, of number states to get a phase. So the phase operator, I would like to write really like a general Hermitian operator. This is very interesting. I write it as phi i. These are the um, eigenvalues of, of, uh, of my operator. And phi i 
eigenstates of the phase operator. It's an emission operator. I just I can always decompose it like this. Um, and you can see with the qubit, you know, what, what is it that you really need to be doing? We've been doing it all the time, actually. So if in this basis you cannot meaningfully talk about your phase, then you really need to go into this basis, you know, to like a Hadamard transformation. And this is a good eigenbasis of the phase operator. That's, after all, what we do to estimate the phase. Do a Hadamard, do another Hadamard, and get the phase out. So the idea was, and the idea is, um, can we, can we do a little bit better than that now when we, when we have n, n different uh, states? What will be the corresponding generalization for n states? And I think the first idea that was, so this was the old fashioned way of thinking about it. The, 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 real, the real kind of modern way of thinking about it is that actually we have PRVMs. And estimating a phase is simply finding a PRVM such that different outcomes of this PRVM give you different phases. So you don't really need to talk about a phase operator as a, as a Hermitian operator. There are all sorts of problems with defining a phase operator. And it's actually it's very similar to defining the time operator in quantum mechanics, because time is a kind of phase into the I omega t. So you, can't, you don't have a time operator. Uh, and in, in some sense, this is what we are trying to do. So lots of people realize that there are some issues with this. You can't maybe do this as rigorously as possible. And ultimately, it turned out that all you need to do is really give me some kind of PRVM with different outcomes of different phases. But it's interesting to pursue this a little bit because you'll see what kind of transformation you want to be able to estimate the phase. So now I say, what happens if I have, if I have more, than, more than two states? Yes, I will have if I have lots of qubits. So what if I have what if I have you know zero plus one plus two for example? I have a Q tree. Uh, what's my what's my so zero, one, and two are my my number number states. They don't have any phase or they don't have a well-defined phase. What about what about uh, what about uh, the superposition like this? And indeed, if you go into the conjugate basis, here you have three possible states. <coughs> And, and you are combining them really with, uh, with uh, it's always the roots of, of unity with the dimension of the, of the system itself. So the roots of unity here, the binary roots of unity are plus and minus one. But if you look, look at cubic roots of unity, then you've got something like um, uh, basically e to the uh, i 2 pi by 3 e to the i 4 pi uh, by 3, okay? And what? So if you, if you sum up these guys, basically what I'm trying to say is that if you sum up these guys, you will get you will get a unity. So one of these guys will not get any phase, or if you like, one of them will get a phase zero, which is one. Uh, this guy will get this phase, and this guy will get this phase. And if you combine them intelligently, you will get always orthogonal states because because the sum of these guys is one. So you'll be doing some kind of basis like that. This and with the plus and minus signs and so on. So you can construct three states which are which are orthogonal states. And here is your phase guy. Okay? Um, and you can generalize this now to n. The only thing you need is an n root of unit. So really what you're constructing is you're constructing a rotative basis and these values here are nothing but um, small n. Sorry, I'm summing up over i. Let me sum up over n to make it to make it better because of the imaginary number. N basically times two pi divided by capital n. Okay, these are my roots of, of n roots of unity. Two pi over n. 2 times 2 pi over n, 3 times 2 pi over n, 4 times, and each of them is a different possible eigenstate of a phase for a finite system. And, and then I have the corresponding rotated state as the eigenstate. And actually, if I measure this guy, I'm going to get a good value of the phase of my state. That's roughly the idea now. Um, and you can see how this works nicely if you take n tending to infinity, because what you will be getting then is, is, is the optical coherent state of some sort. And you'll be talking about you'll be talking about the phase diagram. So this is a little bit of uh, 
a little bit of physics at this stage just to connect it and then to, to make it a little bit there. So this is the real part of this alpha as we call it, and the imaginary part of alpha. And then you've got, you've got some kind of um, amplitude of your coherent state. So this is this coherent state with its uncertainty. And the thing that matters to us is this phase here. And this phase would come out as the average. If you hit my, my phase operator here, well, it wasn't mine. It was Peg, Peg and Barnett, okay, 20 years ago. But if you hit this guy with the state alpha, you'll get the phase of the coherent state out. Okay, so it's nicely defined for quantum operations for, for infinite dimensional systems. It's a little bit more awkward for finite dimensional systems, but actually we'll talk about a very large number of qubits, and I think this, this picture will be a very good picture to have in mind. So what is it that I need to be able to do to, to have states of this, of this type? So again, I will go into the, into the typical scenario that we have here. Um, you imagine someone sending you n qubits. And each of these qubits is in some kind of state 0 plus e to the i phi 1. And you want to ask yourself, what kind of unitary transformation do I need to make here so that when I measure the output here, I get the value of my phase. Okay? So here is the phase, phi 1, phi 2, phi 3, whatever, phi n. These are the digits of the phase. Okay. So this would be something like 0 0.011 in the binary notation, if you like. Doesn't matter whichever. Now we're using qubits, so the binary notation is the most appropriate. So what I want is I want you to input n qubits prepared with some phase, whatever the phase is, as long as it's the same here. And I want the output to be rotated in such a way that by measuring these guys, I get the phase. And now you're starting to see what I should be doing. I should be performing this kind of operations going from the number basis, 0, 1 to n, into the rotated basis with these different n roots of unity. And this is actually called the Fourier transform. This is the same thing as the quantum Fourier transform. You can see it a little bit if you expand the state of these n qubits, e to the i phi. Let me just show you for a few of these, and then it will become clearer. So here is, the, here is the n qubit state that enters, and someone prepares them and says, do whatever you can, whatever is best, to give me the value of phi. And like I said, once you solve this problem, you've actually solved every quantum problem, because everything in quantum mechanics is ultimately encoded in the phase of your system. Um, let's expand it. I have a state with all zeros. Let's call it state zero. So this guy is really 0, 0, and zeros, OK? Plus, I've got a state 1, but the state 1 is the state with a single excitation. And there are n different ways in which I can get a single excitation. For example, I, have, I can multiply 0, 0, everywhere 0 times 1. Or I can take the 1 from here and the rest are zeros and so on. So what I have is e to the i phi times state 1. But my state 1 is actually a state of this type. It's one of those symmetrical superposition of all the possible uh, places where 1 can be with equal amplitude. And now you can see what's going to happen. The next state is going to be the one that contains two excitations symmetrically superposed. And it's going to be multiplied by, by e to the 2 i phi state 2 with two excitations and so on. There are 2 to the n states. The final state is going to have something like n i phi times n. And you see already with, with, with 10 qubits, we are talking about 1,000 different states, 2 to the power of 10. And 1,